Thank you for choosing SSM Health for your joint replacement surgery. And welcome to the online version of our class titled, Preparing You for Your Total Hip Replacement or Total Knee Replacement Surgery. Some objectives of this presentation are to review arthritis and treatments, to review knee and hip anatomy, to review knee and hip replacement surgeries, to review preparation for surgery and discharge from hospital, and to review physical therapy exercises as well as precautions. We'll start by reviewing some basic anatomy, and we'll start by talking about the knee. Compared with other joints, the knee joint is a pretty simple joint. It's comprised of three bones, the femur or thigh bone, the tibia, which is the weight-bearing bone that extends from the knee to the ankle, and the patella or kneecap. There are two types of cartilage in the knee. The first type is the meniscus, and that is the cushion between the bones. And the second type of cartilage is the articular cartilage. This type of cartilage covers the ends of the bone surfaces. There are four ligaments in your knee, one on each side and two that cross in the middle, and three muscle groups that allow your knee to bend and move in the way that it should to function properly. The group in the front is the quadriceps, and two in the back, the hamstrings and the gastroc, which is also known as the calf muscle. The hip is a ball and socket joint, and it's also one of the largest weight-bearing joints in your body. The ball of the hip is also known as the femoral head, and it's at the top of your thigh bone. The socket, also known as the acetabulum, is the part of your pelvis that the ball of the femur articulates with. The hip capsule is made up of bands of ligaments that help to stabilize the joint, and the hip also has articular cartilage that covers the ends of the bone surfaces. Next, we're going to review arthritis. By definition, arthritis is destruction of the articular cartilage. There are several different types of arthritis, 95% of arthritis is osteoarthritis, or degenerative joint disease. There are some smaller percentages of post-traumatic or rheumatoid arthritis that can also cause you to be in need of a joint replacement. Symptoms of arthritis include pain, joint swelling and warmth, and over time you can develop a deformity in your joint. This is an x-ray of a normal knee. And what I mean by normal is that you can see between the femur and the tibia that there's a nice dark line. This means that this person has adequate cartilage in their knee joint. Also, when you look at the outline of the femur, everything is nice and smooth. Also, the femur lines up directly over the tibia, so everything is in good alignment. This is an x-ray of a knee with severe arthritis. As you can see, that nice dark line is gone, and this person has bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. Over time, you can develop bone spurs in this joint that can become very painful, and also, because it is bone-on-bone, -bone, you can have bone destruction. This also can be very painful and also cause an angular deformity in the knee joint. And here they are in a side-by-side -side comparison, which makes it very easy to point out the differences in the two. This is an x-ray of a normal hip. Again, just to review the anatomy, you can see the head of the femur there, and you can also see the pelvis. The nice dark line in between the two means that this person has adequate cartilage in their hip joint. The outline of the head of the femur is nice and smooth, and this hip is in normal alignment. As compared to this x-ray, in this x-ray you can see that the nice dark line in between the head of the femur and the pelvis is gone. This means that this person does not have adequate cartilage in their hip joint. Also, when you look at the outline of the head of the femur, you can barely tell where it ends and the pelvis begins. Over time, this causes bone destruction and can eventually end in an angular deformity of the hip joint. And here they are in a side-by-side -side comparison. You can easily tell the difference between the two. As far as treatment for arthritis goes, we start with the easy things first, and then surgery is considered when the non-operative management fails. Some of the things we think about in regards to conservative treatment are the use of medications. A lot of times the doctor will start with an anti-inflammatory medication. You can even start taking an anti-inflammatory medication at home prior to seeking treatment from a doctor. The prescription anti-inflammatory medications, however, are stronger and longer acting than the medications that you can take over the counter. Many people also try corticosteroid injections. These are a gold standard treatment for arthritis, they're great because they're a single injection that you can have in the office and you can walk away feeling pretty good after this injection. But over time, with both of these, as the arthritis progresses, they become less and less effective. That's when surgery is considered. Having surgery is a very big decision and it requires a lot of thought and a lot of planning. It's not a decision that can be based upon an x-ray. 
It's not a decision that a doctor can make for you. You have to make that decision, and generally, it's based upon your quality of life. When you're not able to go out and enjoy the things that you like to do, and the arthritis interferes with your day-to-day -day activity, that's when most people are considering joint replacement surgery. First, we're going to talk about a knee replacement. We don't necessarily like to call it a replacement, but we like to refer to it as a resurfacing. The doctor will go in and remove the worn cartilage and bone and resurface the knee with metal and plastic components. There are more than 900,000 knee replacements every year in the United States. Again, it's a resurfacing of the entire knee. The surgeon places a metal cover on the end of the femur and a metal and plastic component on top of the tibia. A lot of times when you have arthritis in your knee, you will also have it on the underside of the patella. In this case, the doctor will go in and clean up the arthritis from the underside of the patella and place a plastic button on the underneath so that everything articulates well and moves smoothly together. Knee replacements can be used to correct the major deformities that we discussed earlier and can also be used in rheumatoid and traumatic arthritis. Nine out of ten knee replacements will last well beyond 15 years. In these images, you can see the one on the left is the previous image I showed you with the arthritic knee. In the middle and on the right are what the knee replacement looks like on x-ray. Next, we're going to talk about uni knee or partial knee replacement. With this surgery, patients need to meet a specific criteria. They must have osteoarthritis and an intact ligament on the front of the knee or an intact ACL. It's usually only indicated for patients that have medial or inside knee arthritis. A uni knee prosthesis is approximately one third the size of a total knee prosthesis. The three to four inch incision allows for shorter hospitalization and shorter recovery time. The image on the left shows what a patient looks like who has medial arthritis in their knee. The image on the right is what the uni knee replacement looks like after surgery. Now we're going to talk about total hip replacement. There are more than 450,000 hip replacements performed every year in the United States. The diseased ball is replaced using a metal or ceramic ball and metal stem inserted into the thigh bone. There's an artificial cup placed into the acetabulum. Again, just like with the knee, this can be used to correct those deformities and can be used in patients who have rheumatoid arthritis or a traumatic injury. Nine out of 10 hip replacements will last well beyond 15 years. In this image, you can see the hip arthritis on the left, just like the image I showed you earlier. And on the right, you can see what the hip replacement parts look like after surgery. All of our surgeons do perform some form of minimally invasive surgery. This minimally invasive technique minimizes ligament and tissue damage during the surgery. The surgeon avoids cutting through some of the large muscle groups around the joint. And this allows a patient a more rapid recovery and return to normal activities of daily living. More than 90% of patients will get rid of more than 90% of their pain after these procedures. This allows patients return of joint motion and return to their normal activities. Surgery does not come without some risks and complications. The six that you see on the screen, we're going to review individually. Infection prevention is a big thing on everyone's mind when they're contemplating surgery. The hospital does its job to prevent infection, and you also help with that. The things that the hospital does to prevent infection are using a special surgical soap at the surgical site. Also, all of our rooms are private rooms when possible, so that you're not sharing a room with other people. Also, antibiotics will be given as directed by your surgeon. How you can prevent an infection. You will be directed on how to use chlorhexidine, which is a special type of soap that you'll shower with the night before and the morning of your surgery. Please remember not to touch or pick at your dressing. Follow all wound care instructions given to you at discharge. Please remember to use proper hand washing. Hand washing is the number one best way to prevent infection. Please remember to use proper hand washing after toileting, after blowing your nose, and before eating. Please do not allow pets near your surgical site. This can create an additional risk. After your surgery, you will be given directions on using antibiotics before any invasive dental work. These antibiotics will be directed by your surgeon. Another risk of surgery are blood clots. Blood clots can be prevented in three ways, exercise, medication, and a device called sequentials. Exercise is the number one best way to prevent a blood clot from developing, and you will be instructed on what type of exercises are best for blood clot prevention. 
Medications will also be prescribed for blood clot prevention, and you will take medications at home upon discharge to help with this as well. Sequentials are a device that will be used in the hospital. This consists of a pump at the end of your bed and sleeves that are wrapped around the lower portion of your legs that inflate and deflate, pushing the blood back up toward the heart, preventing it from pooling in the deep veins of the lower legs. Blood loss is another risk after surgery, but very few patients will require blood replacement after total joint arthroplasty. Hip dislocation for our patients who are having total hip replacement is very rare. Less than 1% of patients will have hip dislocation after surgery. And depending on your surgeon and their surgical technique will depend on some instructions that you'll be given in the hospital on some necessary precautions to follow in the hospital and at home. One of the big problems that we see after patients are discharged from the hospital is constipation. So constipation prevention is very important. Some things to consider regarding constipation are to try and resolve any issues that you have with constipation prior to surgery. If that means that you need to take an over-the-counter laxative in preparation for surgery, that is okay. Also, starting now, whether your surgery is tomorrow or not even scheduled, we would like to get on a better regimen of water drinking. At a minimum, our bodies need eight eight-ounce glasses of water a day. So try as best you can to increase the amount of water consumption that you're taking in. Also, try and choose foods that are higher in fiber, especially fresh fruits and vegetables. If you need to use an over-the-counter medication for constipation, the ones that we recommend are Miralax, Senna, or Milk of Magnesia. Do not use bulk laxatives, such as Metamucil. For narcotic-induced constipation, the ones that we recommend are the best. Also keep in mind that if you have trouble having a bowel movement, a glycerin suppository or an enema may be necessary if the above are not successful. If you have any questions about the specific medicines that we recommend, please talk to your pharmacist. Pneumonia prevention is another thing that we are concerned about after surgery. Pneumonia is at an increased risk because of the anesthesia medicines that are used and inactivity. Another reason that it's very important to get out of bed and try to take a few steps on the day of surgery. The other thing that's important to use is the incentive spirometer, and that's the tool that you see on the right of the screen. This is an exercise for your lungs, and you'll be instructed on how to use this as soon as you're finished with surgery. It helps to expand the lungs fully, allowing your lungs to take a big, deep breath. Also, if you are a smoker, it's very important to try and stop smoking prior to surgery. The thing that we worry about the most with cigarettes is the nicotine. Nicotine causes vasoconstriction, and that doesn't allow the nutrients and the oxygen that your body needs for healing to travel to the area that needs to be healed. This could lead to a high risk of postoperative complications that will lead to a stay in the intensive care unit, an inability for your body to heal your wound, and therefore a higher chance of acquiring an infection after surgery. The recommendation is that you try and stop smoking four to six weeks prior to surgery. But any amount of time that you're able to stop, even if it's a few days, is going to be beneficial. We ask you to do so many things in preparation for your surgery. And one of the things we ask is that you visit your primary care doctor to obtain medical clearance. The surgeon who's taking care of you wants to know from your primary care doctor that you are well and you are healthy enough to go ahead and have this surgery. Also, this is important because if there are some things that we need to work on ahead of time to better prepare your body for surgery, we'll have time to do these things. In preparation for surgery, we ask you to do many things. One of those things is to visit the pre-surgery testing center. You want to schedule this testing at least two to three weeks before your surgery. At that appointment, be sure to bring your insurance card and a picture ID. We also ask that you bring copies of Durable Power of Attorney for Healthcare Healthcare Directive, or Living Will, if you have any of those. Bring recent copies of any blood work or an EKG. Bring a list of current medications. While you're at this appointment, there may need to be other pre-op testing performed. You also might meet with an anesthesiologist at this appointment. Please do not eat anything after midnight. While we don't want you to have anything to eat after midnight, you are able to have clear liquids all the way up until two hours prior to your arrival at the hospital. The next thing we're going to discuss is nutrition. Nutrition plays a very important part of your surgery and your healing afterward. If you are a patient who is diabetic or your doctor has told you that you're pre-diabetic, it's very important to keep your blood sugar under good control before and after your surgery. And we know that good nutrition can help maintain lean muscle and strength. 
It can help prevent infection and reduce your chance of being readmitted to the hospital. So starting now and for at least a month after your surgery, we would like for you to follow the anti-inflammatory diet. Within this plan, you're going to get at least 100 grams of protein every day. And we also want you to focus on drinking non-sugary beverages like water, tea, or coffee rather than juices and sodas and other drinks that contain higher amounts of sugar. Do keep in mind that if you have been diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, an excessive protein diet could be contraindicated. So in this case, we would ask that you speak to your primary care doctor to make sure that 100 grams of protein is okay for you. If you have trouble eating protein, or in the case of being home from the hospital and not having much of an appetite, it is a good idea to have a nutrition supplement or a protein supplement on hand. You want to look for protein supplements that are high in protein and less than 300 calories. The ones that you see on the screen are just a small sampling of what's available. Find something that works for you, that tastes good to you, and that you'll know that you have no trouble drinking. Something else we ask you to consider in preparation for surgery is choosing a pal. A pal is an adult family member or friend. It could be a spouse, a neighbor, a son or daughter, someone to help guide you through your recovery. This person might be available for tasks such as transportation, minor help at home, and getting you back and forth to your appointments. This can be not only a physically taxing time in your life, but also emotionally. And we all need someone there with us that can help when we're in our time of need. The next portion of the class covers physical therapy. In preparation for surgery, there are some things that we would like for you to think about in regard to your home environment. First, eliminate obvious hazards such as throw rugs and clutter. Second, add safety modifications such as grab bars, non-slip mats, and night lights. Third, try and measure your doorway and your bed height. Bring these measurements with you to the hospital so that the therapist can accommodate your home living situation. Keep in mind that pets sometimes do create a fall hazard, so please have a plan in place for your pets after surgery. When you're thinking about preventing a fall after surgery, you want to prepare your home prior to. When you're getting up and down, rising from a chair, or getting in and out of bed, take your time and think ahead. Don't ever go without your walker. Also, Wear the right footwear. We would prefer you to wear a shoe that comes around the back of your ankle and heel rather than flip-flops and loose-fitting footwear. If at all possible, we would like for your pal or someone to spend the night with you for the first few nights that you're home from the hospital. This is just for safety's sake. Next, we're going to talk about some things that you can do now, whether your surgery is tomorrow or not even scheduled yet, that will help you be better prepared after surgery. The strengthening exercises that we're going to show you are for patients who have knee and hip replacement. You're going to do these exercises one to two times a day for 10 repetitions each, and as you can see in capital letters, as tolerated. The goal with the exercises is to get you familiar with them, not to cause more pain prior to your surgery. You can find these exercises under the Preparing for Surgery tab in your book. In the videos that we're going to show you, Julie, one of the physical therapy staff members at the Joint Replacement Center, will be talking to you and guiding you through the exercises. We put together a video to show you some of the exercises that we'd like you to work on before your surgery. It's a good way to become familiar with them and you'll also be doing a lot of these after your surgery. We'd like you to perform these exercises one to two times a day for 10 repetitions. Try to perform them on a bed if you can because getting up or down from the floor might be very difficult. The patient you'll see in the video actually just had surgery two days ago and he's doing very well. Some things that you'll want to remember when you exercise is to perform them slow and controlled. You don't want to perform them with quick jerky movements. Also, always return your leg to your starting position and relax your muscle tension in between your repetitions. Lastly, make sure you breathe. Don't hold your breath. This exercise is called an ankle pump and what you'll do is just push your feet back and forth. After surgery, this helps prevent blood clots by increasing lower leg circulation, but we like you to do it before surgery so that you can become familiar.
This exercise is called a quad set. What you'll do is roll up a pillow or a towel and put it under your heel like this, giving a gap between the back of the knee and the bed. What you want to do is push the knee down flat towards the bed and that will tense the thigh muscle that we're trying to strengthen. So push down. So pushing down and hold it for five counts and then relax. Push down and relax. This exercise is called a heel slide. What you'll do is bend your unaffected leg up towards you with your foot flat on the bed. Your affected leg, you want to keep your knees and toes pointed upward and try to bend your knee up as far as you can. And slowly back down. This exercise is called abduction. What you'll do is keep your leg nice and straight and flat down on the bed. Make sure you keep your toes and your knee upward towards the ceiling. Don't let your leg roll out to the side. With this exercise, you'll push your leg over to the edge of the bed and then back to the middle. This exercise is called a straight leg raise. What you'll do is bend your non-affected leg up towards you where your foot is flat on the bed. On your affected leg, you'll want to keep it locked nice and straight at the knee and try to lift the leg up about six inches from the bed. Bring it back down and relax your muscles and go again. You will be up and moving on the day of surgery. Physical therapy will also clear you prior to discharge to go home safely. They will review fall precautions with you. They will review PAL training with your PAL. And they will go over things like walking, transfers, using the stairs, transferring in and out of the car, and most importantly, exercises. Please remember to bring comfortable clothes for physical therapy. If you're having a knee replacement, you don't want to wear anything that's too tight around the knee because the therapist will need to measure your knee flexion or bending. Also, if you're having a hip replacement, you want to wear something that is loose around the waist because we will need to be able to view your incision. The physical therapy goals for you are to prepare you to go directly home. Home is a very great place to be after surgery. Most people recover faster and better at home in their own environment. We also want you to be able to walk safely with a walker in your home. We want you to be independent with your exercise program. And we want to be able to help you with any equipment needs for home. Most people will only need a wheeled walker when they leave the hospital. Other equipment, such as bathroom equipment, grab bars, and those types of things are not generally covered by insurance. Your goals are ice, and then for patients who are having total knee replacement, elevation. You can look in the picture at the bottom of the screen and get a better idea of what we mean when we say elevation. You can see that this man has had a knee replacement and his leg is elevated on a ramp of pillows. You can also see the ice pack stretched across the knee. Ice is very important for patients who are having hip replacement as well, but as you can see, it's pretty difficult to elevate the hip. Your goal is also to be involved, communicate, participate in therapy, and do your exercises. We do use a team approach to the treatment of pain. Our goal is to control your pain at a tolerable level, meaning we would like for you to get through your activities of daily living. Opioid use before surgery may make pain control more difficult after surgery. We would like for you to try to reduce your pre-op opioid intake by 
We're going to ask you to rate your pain on a numeric scale of 0 to 10, and everyone feels pain differently. So what is a 5 to me may be an 8 to someone else. Knowledge is pain medicine. The more you know, the less anxiety or fear you'll have, and the better your recovery will go. Some of the things we use to help control pain are anti-inflammatory medications, opioid medications, cold therapy, positioning and movement, and relaxation techniques. Bringing pictures of your family, listening to music that helps to soothe you, deep breathing, or something like a favorite book to bring to the hospital are things that are going to help relieve your pain. Know that anxiety and fear can cause more pain, whereas calm and movement, including therapy and walking, equals pain control. Also know that your brain's awareness of pain changes based on your emotions, memories, beliefs, and your environment. And your brain's sensitivity to pain is heightened after surgery. That is normal. And consistent movement reduces your pain over time. That is why we encourage you to get up and move and take short walks and do your exercises to help reduce your pain. Knowledge is power over pain. Your doctor, your nurses, and your physical therapist can help answer any questions that you have about pain. There are two types of anesthesia used during joint replacement surgery. The first type is general, and the second type is spinal. The type of anesthesia that you will have will depend on your surgeon's preference. The surgery lasts anywhere between one to two hours. During your surgery, your family will be waiting in the family waiting area. The surgeon will come out after your surgery is complete and talk to your family to let them know that the surgery is finished and that you have moved to the recovery room. Generally, a patient is in the recovery room for one to two hours after surgery. When you get to your room at the hospital, you'll be oriented to the nursing unit, to your nurses, and the other staff. Do know that the surgeon is going to ask a medical doctor to come to see you and follow along in your care while you're at the hospital. If your primary care doctor comes to the hospital that you're at, the primary care doctor will be notified and they will come to see you. If your primary care doctor is not on staff at the hospital, the surgeon will consult a hospitalist doctor to see you. They'll come in and see you each day that you're at the hospital and they'll help follow along in your care. Regarding wound care, there are a few different options. You may have a type of dressing called a silver dressing or Mepilex dressing, or you may have a dressing called a Tegaderm. You can see the two pictured at the bottom of the screen. The one on the right is the Mepilex or silver dressing. The one on the left is the Tegaderm dressing. If you have staples to close your wound, they're going to come out approximately two weeks after surgery. They may be removed by a home care nurse, or they may be removed in your physician's office. This is dependent on your physician's preference. If dressing changes are needed at home, the home care staff will help with that. You can shower with both of these types of dressings once you're home from the hospital and after your first visit with the home therapist. The reason that we ask you to wait to shower until you get home is that you are more familiar with your home environment and your home restroom setup. The home care therapist will teach you how to safely get in and out of your shower. Both of these dressings are water resistant. In regards to discharge preparation, patients are normally discharged the day after surgery. If home care is ordered, it will consist of a physical therapist coming to your house three times each week for two to three weeks after surgery. It also consists of a nurse coming to your house. The nurse makes one to two visits per week for one to two weeks after surgery. Home care will guide you on dressing changes at home. Remember that feelings of being tired, having a decreased appetite, and differences in sleeping patterns are all very normal after surgery, and these things can affect some patients more than others. It is very important to follow the good nutrition guidelines that we have given you, drink plenty of fluids, and complete your exercises to gain your range of motion. In thinking about discharge, we would like for you to arrange for your pal or whoever is going to take you home from the hospital to do that. Please make sure that you have a pain medication prescription for home because getting home from the hospital can be a difficult task. And we will also arrange physical therapy for two to three weeks after surgery. You want to follow up with your physician in two to three weeks after you're discharged. For questions or concerns after discharge, we would like for you to call your surgeon's office. Anytime that you have questions, please refer to your patient education booklet. This can be very beneficial prior to surgery as well as after. 
and knee replacement patients, as a reminder, should elevate their leg to decrease swelling. You will be given specific instructions on how often to do that. Preventing infections at home is a very important part of your recovery process. Please remember, do not touch or pick at your dressing. Follow all wound care instructions. If you are instructed to change your dressing at home, please remember to wash your hands thoroughly before and after your dressing changes. And as discussed earlier, hand washing is the number one best way to prevent infections. So remember to properly wash your hands after you use the toilet, after you blow your nose, and before eating. Do not allow pets near your surgical site, as this can create a greater risk for infection. Wear clean clothes and wash your bedding frequently. Ask your surgeon if antibiotics should be taken before any invasive dental work after your surgery. Please shower as instructed. Remember, you should not take a tub bath until you've been cleared by your surgeon to do so. Thank you so much for taking the time today to listen to our presentation. Should you have any questions, please refer to your physician's office.